Good evening again. We left off with number six in, I believe this is lesson four, right? Lesson four, King Saul. And we left off, we were getting ready to do number six. That's the one I have marked. So that's where we left off. <laughs> anyway, uh, question number six was describe the battle and the victory, list some factors that contributed to Israel's victory. Now, I don't know, um, I wasn't going to reread everything that we went over last week. So, uh, does anyone remember some of the factors and, and how, how this victory was won? We know that uh, they had given a reference back to 1 Samuel 7, where, um, let's see, this was in a previous question, though, wasn't it? But still, it, it applies to this as well in that the Lord intervened on their behalf, right? The Lord intervened. There was terror and fear of the Lord in their camp. The Israelites that were with the Philistines had rebelled. The Israelites that were in hiding came out and helped pursue after the Philistines. The earth quaked. There was confusion in the Philistines' camp. They were greatly confused. And thus that reference back to that earlier battle where God had thundered and the Philistines were so confused that they were overcome before Israel. So similar to that, God had intervened here. Yes? In verse 20, in my version, it okay. says that when Solomon's men went to battle, they found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Right. In verse 20, yeah, that's where they mention that confusion. Right. But, in, but you were talking about the confusion down in verse 20. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was very great confusion. And that is talking about the Philistines having the very great confusion. Yes. God didn't oh. care of that because they were killing each other. Right, and that was a that was a big problem. Israel had no weapons; they were basically unarmed. And here, I think there's maybe six hundred of them, and the Philistines greatly outnumbered them. I don't remember the exact number, but uh, the Philistines did outnumber them, and. Uh, so this kind of solved, the Lord solved that problem for them, basically. Because here they were turning their own swords against each other. Does anyone have anything else on that? All right. So question number seven, what was Saul's curse? If you remember, what, what was the curse that he stated or uttered or however you want to say that? Made? Right. He and it was it was very much irrational and emotional, right? I, I agree. That was that was something that he did in that moment. And I and I can imagine anybody could do something in the heat of the moment, but this seemed cr kind of crazy to me. Uh the the curse was that anyone who ate before evening was cursed was was going to be killed, was going to die. Now, before I go on, why would he do that? Why would he put the people under such a curse? He wanted to see if they would follow his orders. Oh, maybe. Maybe he wanted to see if they would follow him. I didn't think about that. That's a possibility, I suppose. And the thing was, they were supposed to follow the Lord, not him. Right. Any other ideas or thoughts on that? I, um... I had thought perhaps he wanted vengeance because he kind of blamed them for what happened and him uh, losing his kingdom and losing favor with the Lord in this instance. And also, well, and that kind of goes into my next point. Was he angry 
over losing his kingdom and Samuel telling him, you will not have, your kingdom will not endure, your, your kingdom will not last, when, as, when it could have been established forever. So I wondered if he was upset about that. So, but all those, th those thoughts. How is the foolishness of the curse shown? Because it is plainly shown that that was a foolish curse. Right. Well, the foolishness of it was that it's so broad and, and really not thought out, and his own son not having heard it, so everybody wasn't there to hear it, and uh, his own son not having heard it actually had some honey, which technically would have been eating, even though he said it was very little, but yes. Many times you see before somebody goes into battle, but they want their men to eat a lot get their strength that they can fight the battle. And this just weakened them. Now, I've heard of athletes, and it may depend on the sport, that carb load like the day before, so they'll have a lot of energy just for like what you're talking about. I don't, I don't know. I, I would think I would want my people to at least be in decent shape. I wouldn't want them to be starving, fighting, you know. So that is a point. I think Jonathan made that point, too. But definitely, I mean, it could have cost him his very own son, Jonathan. So that that shows just how foolish that is. And in fact, we've seen something like that before. It wasn't in Judges. And I can't remember which judge it was. It just popped into my head. But anyway, it ended up being his daughter. So these these rash oaths, you know, we have to watch out and be careful about those things. Does anyone have anything else on that? Yes, surely. I have a question. Uh, what chapter are you in? I'm about this curse. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's chapter 14. Let me see where he says the curse, because I, I have forgotten. Oh, here it is. Okay. So, let's see, around 24, yeah. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken my vengeance on my enemies. So, see, he is looking for revenge. He's so angry about what had occurred earlier, and he is looking for revenge. Or vengeance, which to me is basically the same. So we're in chapter 14, and these questions will actually take us down to verse 46. I'm sorry about that, Shirley. I, 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 That's okay. I, I, I couldn't attend last week, so. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Verse 46. Now the children of Israel said to Saul, 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 then on question eight, and this is kind of, uh, well, anyway, we'll just go with it. Who was Jonathan? Saul's son, right? So Saul's son. Okay. How was his life endangered? You know, it's kind of funny. These, these, are, these are kind of repeat questions in a way, but how was his life endangered? He didn't follow his, his father's request because he didn't know about it. Right, he didn't know about that, that curse or command or whatever you want to call it, and he uh, did not know about it, so of course he didn't follow it. and He wasn't told, I, th I don't even think it, he was told that until after he had tasted honey and then someone... He wasn't around when it was me. Right, yeah. It's after, it's after he does it, after he... Um, the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth... And his countenance was brightened, right? Then, after he's eaten it, then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And those people were faint. It says they were faint. They were disheartened. They thought Jonathan was going to die, and they didn't want that. Well, Jonathan had a funny response. 
Jonathan has a good response, I think. Jonathan's response in the next verse, but Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now, would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? And he makes a good point. So, I think most military want to keep their um, their fighting people at least content, if not happy. You know, you want to keep them positive and moving. Yes? You know, what's hard for me to understand the whole realm of this is he was chosen by God to be the king. He does everything wrong. And, and his son outshines him all the time. I can't explain that, but yes, that's that's an interesting point because Saul is chosen to be the king. And then, now he does some of the things that God says he would do, though, but we'll get into all that. But he uh, he constantly does the wrong things, you know, right, you know a lot. I'm not sure. I'm just thinking out loud. I think he did it on purpose, just to show the people he wanted this guy to be king. Now here he is. He's going to make a mess of everything. <laughs> And so now here comes David, and he's a man after God's own heart. God uses a lot of things to teach us lessons. That's not an impossibility. I mean, so that's that's possible that he did choose Saul to teach them a lesson about following him and, and really paying attention to what he wanted them to do. And we'll see more of that as we go through this. All right, so, okay, so then the last part, the last question on question eight, what saved Jonathan's life? Right, the people, the people, you know, and ultimately the Lord, because I, I believe, you know, the heat also, but uh, the decided that he should not be cursed and died and uh, you know and die died is died a verb i guess that's wrong but anyway die um so anyway they they intervened so that he would not die he killed right yes sorry Right, it sounds gross. They, they were just eating them raw, just blah. But anyway, yeah, um, that's another problem. How hungry are your people? I mean, when you want, when you forbid them to eat, and then they're, I'm assuming that they are killing these other folks, and that's pretty hard work. Uh, uh, even if they don't fight back very effectively, that's still pretty hard work. You would be hungry, and I imagine this is going on all day, so... Right, and that did cause them to sin, and that and that's a bad thing too. So, right, Saul. Saul seems to be a poor leader. Every time he gets a chance to do something good, because if you remember back last time, Samuel had said that if if he had done what the Lord had asked, had he waited and not gone ahead and performed the sacrifice without Samuel. You know, God would have been with him and would have established his kingdom. So, all right. Question number nine. Since God did not answer Saul's request for counsel that he made in verse 37, let's look at that. Verse 37 so Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he, God, did not answer him that day. So since God did not answer his request for counsel, 
what did uh, Saul, I guess, what did Saul decide to do? Or what did he think because of this silence? What did he seem to think was going on? Okay. He seemed to think there was sin in the camp. Because you'll notice, he, he calls everybody together. Okay. Verse 38, And Saul said, Come over here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see what this sin was today. For as the Lord lives who saves Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. Again, another rash statement. Um, but not a man among all the people answered him. And, and then he had all the people on one side and him and Jonathan on the other. And he had the priest cast a lot. You know, they used those. They had those two stones in their breastplate. And I'm sorry, my closest thing is dice, and it's, but, but I know it's not dice, it's those two stones. But they would toss that as a lot, and they uh, trusted that God would give them the answer through those. Because God was the one that told them to do all this, make the breastplate and, and have the... So that was his one way he was going to tell them things. Yes? I can't remember all of them, but it seems like one of them was white and one was black. I believe that is correct. And so when they reached in there, they didn't know what color they were going to get. Oh, maybe that was it. I always thought of it as throwing dice, but you know, I don't know the particulars of how they did it, so that may be what they did. I don't know. If they did that, then that would be... Okay. So that, that could be, but somehow, how, however their practice was of casting these lots, they believed that God uh, would influence those and give them the correct direction. Yes, I had that somewhere. Yeah, Urim and Th well, Urim and Thummim. You can find you can find it talked about in Exodus chapter twenty-eight, verse thirty. And I put that here, but I didn't put the whole the whole verse here. But that was the two stones. So. So in verse forty-one and forty-two. They're going to cast lots, and the first lot, Saul and Jonathan are taken. So now we know that the people did not commit the sin that Saul was looking for. We know that Saul or Jonathan did. Pardon me. Now, Jonathan has not, I guess, not spoken up at this point. And then they cast another lot, and Jonathan was taken, meaning that he was the, uh, the one who committed the sin. So, and then, this is where we see uh, Jonathan speaks up and says, I only tasted a little honey with the end of my rod. So, I mean, it's not like he stopped and had a meal or anything. And then here's where the people intervene and did not want him to be harmed. So, the end result was Saul concluded there was sin in the camp as we have seen in the past. All right, so now we need to take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 47 through 52. Can I get this yes, what? I'm sorry. Yes. And so the lots were cast. Right. Among the Israelite people and soldiers, and Jonathan and Saul. Yes. And then Jonathan said, Yes, I ate, I only ate a little bit, and so I must die. Right. Once, yeah, once he was taken, once it, I guess Jonathan was just keeping, you know how it is, you just kind of. Well, maybe if I don't say anything, nobody will know. I think Jonathan was just not, he wasn't going to fess up, I guess, till he had to. And I'm not going to totally blame him for that because that oath was kind of a crazy oath. And, but yeah, that was the curse. And that's first uh, Saul grouped him and Jonathan together and all the people. So I think, I think Saul really thought all the people had sinned. Yeah. You know, and then 
when him and Jonathan were taken, he's like, okay, cast it between us. <laughs> and I don't think he expected Jonathan to be taken, but then Jonathan was taken. And Yes, yes, you're welcome. Just, yeah. This whole thing kind of makes you think about Matthew 7 3, where uh, the guy has the law about to die and he says, I'm going to give him a check out of yours because really Saul's the one who's got all these problems and he's yeah. doing wrong and he's saying, well, what did the people do wrong and who sinned? And here Saul is a mess all the time, over and over doing something that not making God pleased, but he's like always pointing at the people. You know, even when Samuel comes to him, he's always got an excuse or whatever. And I right, it just kind of remind me of that. Where, right, Saul is really yes, I mean. So Jonathan was going to accept his fate, and he was going to have to die. From what he says, yeah. But the people said, no, 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 no. Or was it Saul? It was the people that intervened. Let's see. Let's read that. But the people said, because Jonathan says, uh, let's see, Jonathan says, so now I must die. Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. So he's, he's ready, I guess. And then the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan die who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? If you remember, this whole victory started with Jonathan. It didn't start with Saul. And... Um, Let's see. Oh, yeah. Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. So that's, that's a victory for the people and Jonathan, but it's a loss for Saul. It's another loss for Saul. So it's going to be more humiliation because he was... I would think so. And... Saul is causing his own problems. That's what it comes down to. He's not really following the Lord, and he's really causing his own issues with these rash things. I'll just say that that way, the curse and all that. He's causing his own issues. Which, to be fair, I usually cause my own issues. So, I mean, I mean, just, you know, to totally be fair, I mean, if I think about it, that... Uh, I'm not usually trying to curse people to die, though, so maybe that's better. All right, so 1 Samuel, was there anything else on that? I'm sorry. Okay. 1 Samuel, chapter 14, verses 47 through 52. So Saul established his sovereignty, sovereignty over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the people of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he harassed them. <clears throat> and he gathered an army and attacked the Amalekites and delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. The sons of Saul were Jonathan, Jishui, and Mal Malkishua. And the names of his two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Morab, and the name of the daughter, Michael. Maybe that's Mickle, but I say Michael. Um, the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz, and the name of the commander of his army was Adner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle, Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. Now there was fierce war with the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him for himself. Now meaning he's taking that guy for his armies, right? Just so we understand, he's taking him for his armies. Yes. Uh, this area of the kings of Zoba, uh, that's our modern day Armenia. Okay, Zoba is our modern day Armenia. Okay. 
I'm going to be honest. I'm not that great in the Middle East. I still don't know where that is, but I got you. That's fine. I will look that up. <laughs> not far from Lebanon. Yeah, I'm not great. Yes, Pat. It says in uh, chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, when this was all coming about to get a king, mm -hmm. Samuel was told by the Lord, and the Lord, or Samuel told the people, he talking about what the king's going to do. He hasn't been appointed. And he said, Samuel said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. That's what he's doing. He said he's got the best man he could get. That, that he's doing exactly what God said he would do, and that's, yep. Because God had said that he would take their sons, and that's what he's doing. Okay, so question number 10. What nations did Saul battle during his reign as king? And there's a number there that we can hit on. Edom, Moab, Ammon, Zoba that you mentioned, and of course the Malachites and and uh, the Philistines, right? So he, of course, the Philistines, of course, he fought them. I think it said, boy, how did it say that? It said uh, all the days of Saul. So he was at war with the Philistines all all the days of Saul. So that was continual. All right, so we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're basically out of time for tonight, so I'm going to stop here, and then we'll pick up from here. Yes, I think. Oh, do you want to do? Okay, okay. I would, I would do more anyway. Okay, so question number 11. Who was captain of Saul's army? Abner. That was Abner, so right? And uh, then it says, what was his relationship to Saul? He was a cousin. He was a cousin. His cousin was, it was Abner was the son of his uncle, Ner. In other words, now this dance is all around it. I would have said this differently just because of the way I am. You know, I would have said that they were cousins and that uh, Ner and uh, Kish were brothers. But that's not the, really the way the Bible says it. it. It says it in a different way. And I think that's just, they were they were very in tune with their ancestry and genealogy and the way they said these things sometimes was different than what I think of nowadays. But that was the end result that uh, Kish and Ner were brothers and uh, Abner and Saul were cousins. So a little nepotism, I guess, going on there. I mean, I guess that's going to happen in any most any uh, government, I suppose. Okay. All right, so I will stop there, and we'll come back and pick up with question 12 next week. Thank you for your time and your attention. So we have this time here, a little bit of time for an invitation here, and I, I wanted to talk about something that's actually, I think it's kind of in line with the things we've been studying here. If we look at Judges chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land of which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. Well, we read this, and a lot of times we look at this in a historical way. You can easily relate these events and these things that occurred in Israel's past 
to us today and the things we see. See, we cannot make a covenant or a treaty with evil and maintain a covenant with God. When we choose God and make our covenant with Him, we are choosing to eliminate evil from our lives. It is a process and it, it does take time, but we cannot also have altars to other gods. We cannot continue to have idols or worship other things. We cannot accept and play around with things we know are immoral and wrong. We must tear down those altars to sin. Those things in our lives that draw us away from God, that pull us and tempt us to do immoral things. Now we're talking about personally in our own lives here. We're not looking at others, we're not judging others, but we are examining ourselves, judging ourselves. If we have things that we allow in our lives, even though we know they are wrong, those are kind of our altars to sin. Those are things we know that are moral, we know that they're wrong, but we, we keep them around. Maybe they're a secret sin that we don't think anyone knows about, or maybe we just don't even really care. Maybe we just do it anyway, but the Lord knows regardless. He always knows because he is faithful and is always with us. We in turn must also be faithful to God. That's a lot of what we're seeing about in all our studies is that we need to be faithful to God. We must not give room to Satan, the devil, evil, or immorality. When we do, these things are a thorn and a snare for us. They get us into further trouble, just as God mentions above. Because we allow them in our lives, God will not remove them. We must remove them. Because we choose them over God, and He wants us to choose Him first. He wants us to choose Him and life, and not death, not the cursing. And you see the results here in these verses a little further down in the chapter, Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. And this is the end result of having other gods, of having idols in our lives, we will end up serving them instead of serving God. The more comfortable we become with allowing things like this in our lives, the further we move away from the Lord. And we've probably seen that in different people. We've probably seen folks who seem to kind of drift away over time. And that can happen. That is a, uh, we, even in our Hebrew study, we're cautioned against drifting away like that, but it can happen. Most of the time, our sin or our idol is really just ourselves. It's really just what we want versus what God has already told us, but we want what we want. <laughs> we do. I mean, we're, we're people just like the Israelites. They, they wanted things, and so that's what they would try to get. So, you know, we're stubborn, we're selfish. How many times are they called stiff-necked? And that's, we're, we're very similar. We're just normal people. We don't want to let go of things from our past, maybe from our past life. And we find it hard to get rid of old habits. So we make excuses to try to justify our actions. It's uncomfortable to change and become the new creature we're supposed to be fully. It's, it's difficult, but that is exactly what we need to do. We are to grow into that new creation that God has made us and grow into the salvation that Jesus bought us. We cannot just go part of the way. We must follow the Lord all the way to the end of the path, dropping the weight of our sin as we mature and become more like Jesus. It's a wonderful transformation if we will work on it, but it does take work and commitment to God. And it also gives us true freedom the freedom to be the godly, loving Christians that 
we should be, that God wants us to be. So, as I said, this is a time that we set aside, and if anyone has any issue or need that we could possibly help you with, please come forward as we stand and sing.